Last time we took a look at the historical origins of the King Arthur tradition. We went back and looked at the historical setting of the sub-Roman era. Actually, we took a look at the Roman era and the sub-Roman era, and that's the era that uh, King Arthur is traditionally placed within the late 5th century, early 6th centuries AD. After that, we took a look at the question of who King Arthur may have been based on, if there was a historical person behind the entire legend, or maybe several historical people behind the legend. And we dealt with that uh, really interesting detective story about the historical King Arthur, which has been done by I don't know how many scholars over the number of centuries past. But we finished up looking at an evolution of the actual story, and that was one of the neat things, is we could actually see a working out of the tale as different pieces are put into place over the course of centuries. And we finished up with the massive and definitive work by Sir Thomas Mallory known as La Morte de Thur. And that is a work, remember, that draws on a lot of the material that preceded Mallory. As a matter of fact, it kind of compiles it all together in a nice, coherent, somewhat coherent narrative. What we're going to do today is we're going to take a step back and go to some mythological inclusions in the material. We're going to start by taking a look at the Grail and actually work through another evolution of the Grail tradition. It's a little bit more brief treatment than we did with Arthur in general, but we're going to study the Grail, where it comes from, and how it's adapted into the King Arthur tradition and emerges as the the, the item that we think of today when we think of the Holy Grail. And then we're going to take a look at a, just a few other mythological stories or elements that have found their way into King Arthur. Because if you remember when we talked about the Arthurian tradition, it was one of those traditions that ends up swallowing up lots of other things that were going on. Even Stonehenge, which we mentioned was, you know, 3000 BC, this pre-Celtic monument right there in Britain ends up finding its way into the Arthur tale. Okay, lots of other things do as well from Greco-Roman mythology, from Christianity, from Celtic mythology, Germanic mythology. So we're going to take a look at that. And then after that, we're going to turn to um, the story as found in, for the most part, Mallory, and just do an overview of the story, focusing specifically on the court romance between Lancelot and Guinevere and the fall of Camelot. And after that, if we have time, we'll take a look at some of the modern adaptations of Arthur into the movie uh, industry. So let's pick up where we left off, and this time it will be with the Grail. I think everybody's heard of the Grail. This is one of the most famous items in all mythology. There are a lot of famous magical items that show up from oh, Perseus's uh, winged sandals to, I guess, the sword and the stone. I mean, there are a number of others. Uh, out there as well. I'm blanking out on some of them right now, but the Grail is the one that is probably the most easily recognizable. And it's probably because we think of it as a Christian symbol, but we also think of it in the context of the Arthur tradition. But how did it actually come to be in the Arthur tradition? How did it actually come to be a Christian symbol? Because in the initial stages of its development, it seems to be a pre-Christian item. All right, so let's talk a look at the evolution of the Grail, going back to its Celtic origins. And those are going to be in the stories that we have from Wales and from Ireland, really between the 11th, I'm sorry, 7th and the 11th centuries um, AD. These tales are going to very often have certain elements that are going to set a pattern for the traditional Grail story. So for instance, the pre-Christian elements that are going to show up in a normal Grail story will be things like a crossing of a water. Crossing of a water um, is something that we've seen over and over again in mythology, right? This is the idea of this journey to the underworld, this journey to the afterlife, or in this sense, a journey to the other world, okay? This crossing of the waters of death we saw as early as Gilgamesh. We saw it when you enter Hades and going across the river sticks into the underworld. Um, again, you're going to have this mysterious journey, this um, liminal transition across this um, boundary, okay? So you're going to have that very often, and it's, like I said, attached to going into another world. In the Celtic mythologies, you'll see this idea of an other world, which is often a place of the divine, a place of um, death, a place that might represent eternal youth or even imprisonment. It's used in various different ways in different stories, and often you enter the other world through some kind of cave or by crossing a body of water like the sea, and sometimes you're invited in by having a mysterious woman show up offering you an apple. Apple, okay, and in the wealth tradition, the world—one of the names for the other world—is Anwin, okay. So, 
Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this as we go forward. But another thing that's added in here is the idea of a cauldron. Now, cauldrons were incredibly important in Celtic mythology. You have a number of different cauldrons, magical cauldrons, show up, and these are also associated with life and rebirth and usually attached to the other world. Okay, there's a famous story in Celtic mythology about Bran the Blessed. Um, this particular character has a cauldron that is known as a cauldron of rebirth. It's from the second branch of the Mabinogi where he gives this cauldron as a gift um, to his sister's new husband, King Mathewick of Ireland. Okay, Branwen is the sister. She marries this guy, Mathewick, who's given this um, Père de Dany, which is the cauldron of rebirth. And then later in the story, after he starts to mistreat Branwen, Bran and his soldiers end up going into Ireland to avenge her. And ultimately, you see the cauldron used where the dead warriors are placed within it and returned to life, okay, without the power of speech. So you've got this idea of magic and rebirth. In another um, Irish myth, the story of Dagda, the god who is known as the good god, the god of fertility, possesses another magic cauldron known as the cauldron of plenty, which produces enough food always to feed however many people are hungry. You never run out of food if you've got Dagda's cauldron of plenty. So here you've got this idea of a cauldron associated with abundance, associated with life, associated with food, associated with rebirth. Okay. There's even a tradition uh, in the Welsh poems of King Arthur. Um, it's in a story known as the Spoils of Anwin, which dates probably to around the 10th century, where he actually goes into the Celtic underworld known as Anwin and steals a magical cauldron of inspiration that is possessed by these nine priestesses. Okay, now I want you to remember the number nine, nine maidens, nine priestesses, nine sorceresses. You're going to see these mystical women associated with places like Anwen. Here's this story where you've got the nine priestesses of Anwen. We're going to see parallels to that uh, as we go forward, and I'll you know, remind you as we get there. The picture you're actually looking at on the screen is what's known as the Gundestrup Cauldron, which is in Denmark. It's actually in a museum in Denmark. And it's got a number of Celtic um, illustrations or, or, or elements in the the cauldron itself. This is a highly decorative work of art. This is not the type of cauldron you would use for your daily cooking, most like. But you know, it's, it definitely shows you the importance of a uh, of a of a implement like a cauldron. Okay, it's obviously a special treatment. Another element that we find in the story is the idea of the wounded king, some kind of king wounded by um, a, a, a spear wound or a sword wound usually to the thigh and associated with the barrenness of the earth. When the king is wounded, the earth suffers with him. This is another Celtic idea where the king's prosperity, the king's health is translated into the, the health and prosperity of the realm, the health and prosperity of the fertility of the earth, uh, going back to the early, you know, um, chthonic ideas within mythology. All, right, all this stuff finds its way into the Arthurian tradition by the 12th century. Okay, but in the earliest versions of the story, it's not going to be a Christian item because clearly um, what you're looking at here is a pre-Christian element. So let's first take a look at a story that comes out of the Welsh tradition. There's a little bit of controversy as to exactly when this story was written. Um, it's the son of Peridur, son of Ephrog. It's an anonymous, uh, anonymous Welsh romance that's associated with the Mabinogion, the White Book of Rhythric. Uh, which actually dates to the 12th or 13th century, but the story itself is possibly much earlier, though there is, like I said, debate as to exactly the chronology here. So there's this kid, Peridor, and he, in the story, ends up going to this magical castle, which is owned by his uncle. While he's there, a number of things happen. You have a sword that breaks, he sees a lance bleeding, and a platter brought before him, carrying the severed head of an individual who he comes to find out is his cousin. And then by the end of the story, a story, he and Arthur end up coming back to the castle to avenge the people that murdered his cousin, which happen to be these nine witches okay, of Gloucester, the nine witches of Gloucester. So here you've got some of the basic elements that you can actually see in some of the earliest Grail stories. Now, the elements that are interesting, of course, you've got the story that I just talked about, the spoils of Anwen, where you've got Arthur going down and getting this cauldron from the underworld, and he, of course, encounters the three priestesses. In this story, of course, there's three witches, 
Okay, so it's clearly a parallel. As a matter of fact, if you remember when we talked about Geoffrey of Monmouth and his life of Merlin, I think I mentioned that when he introduces the character of Morgan for the first time, by name, associated with the island of Avalon, she was one of nine sorceresses that resided at Avalon. So you've got this idea of Anwen and the nine priestesses. You've got the idea of Avalon and the nine sorceresses. You've got this idea here in Paradory of the nine witches. So again, you've got the same elements, including the idea of a cauldron or a platter in this case, carrying a head, uh, which incidentally should also be Something that would remind you, if you were familiar with it, with the story of Bran the Blessed, which I just mentioned a second ago. Because at the end of the story of Bran the Blessed, he's actually decapitated, and Bran's head is carried back to England, um, uh, kind of like you see in this, this image here. So again, the decapitation, the, the cauldron or platter, the other world, um, all these things are, are parallels. Okay, So you've obviously got this type of Celtic mythology that's being morphed and changed and incorporated into other later stories. There's no grail, however. Okay, There's a platter that carries a head. It's not called uh, a grail, as far as I know, in the Welsh. But the next story we're about to look at does introduce the concept of a grail. Now, the next story is also very, very similar to this story of Peridur. As a matter of fact, it's going to use a character um, of a different name, a different version of the same name. Peridur is usually the Welsh version of a character that's known more commonly as Percival. Now, Percival is going to be one of the most important knights in the Arthurian tradition of the search for the Holy Grail. And this early version of the Grail story is introduced by Chrétien de Troyes in his Comte de Graal, which dates to about the 1180s. Now, the question for scholars is, which came first? Was it Chrétien's work, or was it the story of um, Peridur? Did one borrow from the other? Which one borrowed from which? Were they both working on some kind of earlier tradition that they were drawing from? Because there's really close similarities, but there's also some radical differences between these two stories. But it's this story that's going to be the beginning of really the Grail tradition. So let's take a look briefly at how it works out. You're introduced to this kid by the name of Percival. Now what we know about Percival in uh, the beginning of the story is he's poor, he is ignorant, he's very inquisitive. He's raised in the woods kind of away from everybody with his mother. He doesn't have a father, he doesn't have any brothers. His father and brothers were knights, we find out, and they were uh, killed years earlier. And the mother has wanted to kind of protect him from that entire world of um, knightly combat. She wants to keep him safe. So he's brought up essentially with the loss of identity, right? He doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know his relationship to this noble class of knights that he comes from originally. Now, one day he does see knights approach in the woods, and he thinks when he first sees them in their, their armor that they're angels, they're something otherworldly, and he begins to question them about all kinds of things, about you know what it is they're wearing, what it is they're carrying, and they get a little bit irritated that this kid doesn't know anything about anything, apparently, and keeps asking these annoying questions. At some point, he um, ends up becoming a knight because he follows these guys to King Arthur's court. He ends up becoming a knight, so he gets in touch with his destiny or his lineage for the most part. But he's given the advice along the way that he needs to learn how to not ask so many questions. He needs to keep his mouth shut um, because it's inappropriate to act like that, okay? And he doesn't come across very well. Now, as the story goes on, we're introduced to the Fisher King which is this king who has been wounded in the thigh. He ends up being the host to Percival, invites him to his castle, and provides him with food. And in the midst of this guest host scenario, he's given a sword that for some reason is destined to shatter, destined to break. And then he sees a procession come through the hall, which is the grail procession. In it, you see a dripping spear, or spear rather dripping with blood behind it, a candelabra being carried, and then this golden platter that's referred to as a graal. Okay, now the word graal, by the way, is, I didn't really talk about, I probably should have introduced the term, it actually comes from the Latin gradale, which means in stages. So uh, this was the common term for a serving platter at this point in the development of the story. So when you're introduced to this graal, it was a plate. It's not a cup yet, okay? And it was used to serve, and the reason it's, you know, it, it, in the stages, this idea of uh, gradual, the word gradual actually comes from that root word in Latin. But 
It's because, you know, you would serve different courses of a dinner on the serving platter. So here's this platter that's brought out in front of him, and there's another platter that's carried behind that, and the procession kind of goes through and then just disappears, and he follows the advice he was given and doesn't ask any questions. This is really strange, but he doesn't ask what's going on. And you find out later that it's because he fails to ask the right questions, the right questions being, why does the spear bleed, and whom does the grail serve, if he asked those questions, he would have actually healed the wounded king, okay? Now you come to find out later that the platter is serving uh, the wounded king's father, the fisher king's father, and it's keeping him alive with this single communion wafer that's being brought to him. So you've got this Christian element right there with the communion wafer, but the story itself is never finished. We don't find out anything more than that. kind of leaves you hanging which is very frustrating if you've ever seen a TV series that introduces um, you know, a lot of great plot line and all of a sudden, for some reason, the network cancels it before the next season airs and they left you with a cliffhanger. I always hate that. I've seen a number of seasons that have done that. Um, and you want somebody to come along and finish it. And uh, you're just left very frustrated. That's kind of the, what happens after uh, Chrétien f- fails to finish Comte de Graal. So you have a bunch of people come along afterward and attempt to actually finish the story. They're going to do what I think today we would call kind of fan fiction. They're going to pick up where the story leaves off or maybe even rework the story. So um, after this story, let's look at a few of the Grail continuations just really briefly. There are at least four um, mentionable Grail continuations after Chrétien. The first one is going to be uh, around 1200. It's an anonymous work. We don't know who wrote it, but in it, they shift away from Percival to the figure of Gawain. Okay, uh, He's going to be the Grail Knight in that version. The second version, around the same time by Gachier, is where Percival the Roar turns to the Grail Castle in the end. The sword which has broken, he never ends up mending. Then the third finish, or, or continuation, around 1230, Manessier, Percival becomes the Grail King and ends up ruling for seven years, and then at the end goes to heaven along with the Grail and the Lance. And then around the same time, the fourth continuation by Gerber is where Percival returns to the Grail Castle and completes the mending of the broken sword. And, you know, none of these really have added anything incredibly important to the tradition, so we need to wait around for the next source, and this is going to be the one that are really going to make a difference in the evolution of the tale. So let's take a look at the Grail as it becomes officially for the first time the Cup of Christ. This is what you tend to think of when you think of the Holy Grail. Okay, now this version is a little bit earlier than those other continuations, so we can think of it in a way as a continuation as well, but it's the one that really is going to affect the later traditions. And it's done by Robert de Baron a work known as Joseph of Arimathea. Sometimes it's known as the History of the Graal. It's the first work to identify this item with the Last Supper. And it's said to be the thing that fed Jesus at the Last Supper. And it also is something that this guy Joseph of Arimathea used to catch the blood of Christ when he was on the cross. Okay. Now, if you don't know who Joseph of Arimathea is, this is a figure that's mentioned in the New Testament. He was a follower of Jesus who... Um, was kind of a wealthy Pharisee who, uh, after Jesus' crucifixion, the body was taken down and given to Joseph, and it was buried in Joseph's tomb. Okay, we don't find very much about very much else about Joseph in the canonical scriptures, but there are mentions of the character in later tradition. Okay, now in this work, uh, he ends up traveling with this cup or this bowl, it's really not even clear which it is, to the west along with his sister and his brother-in-law Bran, which is whose name actually is very similar to the character Bran. Remember Bran the Blessed who is associated with this cauldron of rebirth. Here you've got another character, Bran, very close, who's also now associated with this cup of Christ. Um, he starts a community. The community ultimately suffers from s- famine due to sin. And then He ends up setting up, this is Joseph still, a table which is going to commemorate the Last Supper. It's a second table used to represent the original Last Supper meal. And on it he places the grail and then there's a fish that is placed there as well, which was caught by Braun who is characterized as this fisherman figure. And this is kind of the origin supposedly of the Fisher King idea. Now the idea with this table is anybody who approaches it 
in the right manner, and there's this ecstatic experience, right? This this connection with the divine that they experience. If you're a sinner, however, you try to sit at this table, you end up being swallowed up by the earth. This is the ori- origin of what comes to be known as the siege perilous, this seat of Christ that only the purest can reside in. Okay, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But now we've got the table, you've got um, at least a second table, you've got a custodian in the figure of Bronn, who is now called the rich fisherman, and it's eventually brought into Britain, not by Joseph himself, but by the people that he leaves behind. And then you get this idea that the, the grail is going to wait there for a third table, for a third grail keeper, and that third table is going to be, of course, Arthur's famous round table. Now, um, I should, probably should have brought some of the text up as we were going because I just mentioned all of this and I didn't advance the uh, text for you guys. <clears throat> so the other story, because uh, Robert de Maron wrote in a few other works as well, including a work on Merlin, which I think I mentioned last session. <clears throat> he wrote one on Percival. This happens to be lost. It was written around the same time, a little bit later than Joseph of Arimathea. But we do have other versions of the Percival story that seem to be based on Robert, uh, Robert's version, you known as the Dido Percival, which is an anonymous work. Um, we come to find out that Braun ends up having 12 sons, reminiscent of the 12 apostles. Um, one of his sons, Alain de Gros, ends up becoming the next Fisher King and the Keeper of the Grail. Braun's grandson ends up being Percival. So you've got this lineage of the character Percival now attached all the way back to Joseph of Arimathea and to the story of Jesus, okay, which is the new addition. <clears throat> Percival character in this story ends up going on a quest. Eventually, by the end of the story, he's able to heal the wounded king. He heals the land. Um, and then when he dies, again, he's taken to heaven along with the spear and the grail. Okay? So... That's this uh, addition. The next stage is with the introduction of, I think, the fully Christianized vision of the Grail. I mean, not that it wasn't already Christianized by Robert de Baron, but it's going to become, I think, officially Christianized when you get to the emphasis that we find in the quest of the Holy Grail around 1225. This is part of what's known as the Volga Cycle. And it's anonymous prose romance. I mentioned the Vulgate Cycle before. It's an incredibly important collection of writings. This is one of the most important in that series. It's often known as the Lancelot Grail Cycle as well. And this is the version that's going to be influential because it's going to be picked up by Mallory. And what makes it fully Christianized, I think, is the fact that it is truly a holy grail at this point. And the emphasis is placed on certain Christian values, Christian virtues, Christian ideals, where it asserts the... Um, values of virginity and asceticism over and opposed to romantic and courtly love and chivalry and the things you usually associate with the Knights of the Round Table. So it tries to pick up with this idea of, you know, what is the proper monastic life? That's the proper life, right, in virtue. The idea of uh, living according to confession and fasting and prayer, purity, communion, all the things that a good monk would do. And then he ultimately will attain some kind of union with God. But again, it's only through this idea of purity and sinlessness if that can be attained. So the main character here is no longer Percival. The person that replaces Percival is a knight by the name of Galahad. And in the visual you see on the screen, this is the round table with the grail kind of appearing in front of everybody. And at the very back is the figure of Galahad, kind of the most obvious central figure standing above, you know, head above everybody else around him, including King Arthur, who's, you know, two to his left. You've got Galahad, Percival, and then King Arthur with the crown on. But it's Galahad that stands out, because in this text, it's exactly what's supposed to happen. Galahad stands out, right? He is going to be the epitome of the pure warrior. He's going to be the purest of the knights. He's going to be the ultimate warrior monk, kind of in the order, the, in the um, tradition of the uh, monastic orders that you find during the Crusades. Remember, this material was being crafted at the time when the Crusades were at their peak. Right, The Crusades began in 1095 with uh, Pope Urban II calling the First Crusade. They conquered Jerusalem in 1099. And you have a new kingdom in Jerusalem that was set up after that, which lasts for quite a while. In the midst of all that, particularly in the beginning of the 12th century, you've got the new institutions known as the Templars, the Hospitallers, all these different orders of knights which were monastic orders, okay, which is a new thing, 
right? This idea of a knight who swears celibacy and purity, and his job basically was to guard pilgrims to the Holy Land. Well, here's Galahad, which is, who's very much in that line. He's like a Templar knight at King Arthur's court. And he replaces Percival because Percival is more of a romantic figure. Um, he is, in a way, also a replacement for Lancelot. And in the story, if you don't know it, he's actually the son of Lancelot. And he's actually knighted by Lancelot in the tale. Now, Lancelot ends up having the child, um, doesn't really know because he's... Uh, anyways, what happens is there is uh, Lady Elaine of Corbenic who ends up sleeping with Lancelot, and she conceives Galahad. Now, he didn't realize, you remember Lancelot is in love with Guinevere, he doesn't realize that he's sleeping with Elaine because he's kind of uh, enchanted, where he believes it was Guinevere that he was going to bed with, and of course he's fooled, departs, and Galahad is later born and raised away from his father, which is, again, the typical heroic thing, right? You're born with kind of a um, separation from your true identity, your true father. Anyways, we find out that Elaine is the daughter of King Peles, who happens to be the Fisher King. And Galahad uh, is going to then be the descendant of this lineage, right? So he would trace himself all the way back again to Joseph of Arimathea in some way. Now, the Siege Perilous is also plays a big role in this, in this story. Now, the Siege Perilous is located, the, the Perilous Seat, rather, is located at the Round Table. And there's an inscription on the seat which says, that you know, 454 years prior, these years are now complete since the Passion of Jesus, and it says that on Pentecost of this year, the seat will find its occupant. Now, the seat is the only seat at the Round Table that has remained vacant. The Round Table, remember, symbolizes equality, but there is a special seat there, which swallows up anybody that is unworthy. They're kind of literally taken down into the earth, which seems to indicate that it's not completely a table of equality anymore as it's morphed because there's a special seat which indicates there's somebody that is superior or different that is going to reside there and that inscription remains until the arrival of Galahad. Another thing that shows up at the time when Galahad shows up at the court of King Arthur is a stone, a red marble stone with a sword in it, kind of like the sword that Arthur originally pulled to become king and this one says that you know whoever uh, this is destined to be pulled out by the best knight in the world. And all the knights, of course, try to pull it out and fail. But then Galahad appears wearing this shining red armor. We find out that he's a descendant of King David, Joseph of Arimathea. you got this lineage going all the way back to the Bible. And then the Siege Perilous has a new inscription miraculously appear on it, which inscribes his name, Galahad. Okay, so he fulfills this prophecy, the awaited knight, and then he draws the sword from the stone. Afterward, you end up getting this vision of the grail that begins the actual grail quest. All the knights are now going to go out in search of this holy object. Everybody fails there as well. You know, Gawain fails, Lancelot fails. He ends up with a partial vision, but he's never going to be pure enough to obtain a full vision because of his romance with Guinevere. He actually has to put her aside in this story and do penance before he's even granted the little vision that he has of it. But Ga Galahad is accompanied by Percival and Bors. Those are going to be his two companions, and they're the ones that get the closest to a full vision. Um, we find out that the, the Grail has been residing at the castle of Corbenic. Um, the land has been wasted. The Fisher King's there. You've got all these visions and miraculous things that happen. Eventually, um, the Grail is taken with Galahad, Percival, and Bors back to the Holy Land, back to the city of Siraz, which is this made-up city in the Middle East. And Galahad eventually has his full vision of the Grail. He serves as king uh, for a year. And then at the end, he takes communion. He dies, and he's taken up into heaven along with the grail and the lance. Okay, Now that's the version. It basically at that point it disappears from the story of Arthur. Okay, That's the story that Mallory is going to adopt and bring into his great work. Now, oh, I should have brought up some of these visuals. There's a, a picture of uh, Lancelot pulling the sword from the stone. Again, reminiscent of King Arthur. And here is a uh, work kind of cut in half where you've got Sir Percival, Sir Boris, looking on in front of these angels, right behind these angels, and in front of them in the lower panel you see Galahad kind of in the, uh, not kind of, but actually in the position of prayer before the table that has the grail on it and these other angels right behind that. Okay, so this is the evolution, and it's not the only version of the grail that we have. We've got even other versions that are maybe even more bizarre. So you have this idea of it being a platter, a serving tray, um, 
this cup of Christ in Wolfram von Eschenbach's version, known as Parzival, he makes the grail into a gemstone. Okay, he introduces a different fisher king, a king by the name of Van Fortas. Um, the gemstone idea is, again, something that provides food and eternal youth and tends to remind me more of the idea of the philosopher's stone that you get out of the alchemical, alchemical tradition, right, out of alchemy, which you may have heard of if you're a fan of Harry Potter. I mean, the first book, Harry Potter, is about this quest for the philosopher's stone. So you've got that kind of idea there. Um, again, Mallory, I'm going to mention one more time, he's the one that picks up with the version that we get in the quest. Uh, King Pelham is the fisher king there, and King Pelham ends up being wounded by the lance in this story. His wound comes from the hand of Sir Balin. Uh, in self-defense, he's fighting with King Pelham and wounds him in the thigh with the holy lance. It's called the Dolorous Stroke, okay? And then he need, he's later, you know, healed by Galahad. And then lastly, I'm just going to mention Wagner, Richard Wagner's uh, opera. He takes uh, the Parzival story and he crafts it into an opera. It's actually his last opera. And since we mentioned him having done this great ring cycle um, based on the Nibelungen lead and the uh, tradition of the Volsungs, uh, you got to throw in Wagner one more time because he also picks up on this other great tale of the Grail. And this isn't it. I mean, the Grail has extended influence, exerted influence on our imagination all the way through to the modern day. I mean, you can find this captured in motion pictures. So let me show you a couple clips from different movies that handle the grail in some interesting ways. The first one is actually going to be a clip from the movie Excalibur, and this is at the very tail end of a really bizarre series of events that are part of the grail quest, where you've got all these knights going out for years and years, um, dying horrible deaths. It's a very dark part of the movie. If you've never seen Excalibur, it really is an overly dramatic presentation, kind of an epic version of the King Arthur story done on film. And I usually refer to the Grail quest as kind of a psychedelic journey <laughs> of a sense. But you're going to see this um, picture here. Now, Excalibur as a movie was based primarily on Le Morte de Thur, on uh, Mallory's work. But it does take liberties, and I think that was to essentially simplify the story, which obviously needs to be done. You can't really make all of Mallory into a motion picture. It would take you know, a series of motion pictures that go on forever. But where I said Mallory borrows the story of Galahad, the movie returns to the character of Percival. And instead of the Fisher King being a separate character introduced, they turn Arthur into the Wounded King. So you've got a lot of the same elements, but different characters are doing the different um, roles. Again, to simplify it, I think. So let's take a listen and look at this last part of the scene from Excalibur. What is the secret of the Grail? Who does it serve? You, my lord. Who am I? You are my lord and king. You are Arthur. Have you found the secret that I have lost? Yes. You and the land are one. So like characters we've seen before in mythology, here's the king dying but not dying, right? He can't die, but he's suffering. Um, until the healing uh, drink is given to him in the movie. This is, you know, reminiscent, if you remember, the story of Phineas on the island uh, with the story of Jason and the quest for the Golden Fleece, an earlier quest story, right? The same type of idea. And of course, Jason and his men, you know, end up feeding um, uh, King Phineas um, at the, that table after they drive away the harpies. Okay, so um, again, similar elements show up in different stories. I like the way that they do this here. They kind of reverse the idea of Percival because remember, Percival was this guy who asked all kinds of questions. Um, and when it came time to ask the right question, he fails to ask the right question. Uh, in this movie, it's like the questions are being asked to him and he's now answering it, um, which is interesting. And in the movie, they kind of you know deal with Percival as kind of this annoying kid who asks a lot of questions in the beginning as well. So I, I do like the way they characterize Percival in the movie. But, um, you know, you got this really spiritual attitude and aspect, and it's a very serious portrayal of the Grail in a Hollywood film. 
it's not always going to be a serious portrayal of the grail. As a matter of fact, the next clip I'm going to show you is using the grail. I mean, this becomes really the title of one of the greatest comedy movies in my, from my perspective. It's a movie that you may have heard of called Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And here you're obviously taking it a little less seriously, actually not seriously at all. So here's a scene where the knights have uh, gone and they're on the quest now for the grail. And these are my knights of the round table. Whose castle is this? This is the castle of my master, Guido Luamba. Go and tell your master that we have been charged by God with a sacred quest. If he will give us food and shelter for the night, he can join us in our quest for the Holy Grail. Well, I'll ask him, but I don't think he'll be very keen. Uh, he's already got one, you see. What? He says they've already got one. Are you sure he's got one? Oh, yes, it's very nice. I told him we already got one. <laughs> okay, so you've got the comedy take on the grill. And this actually is one of the, the, like I said, one of the greatest comedy movies. Obviously, it's poking fun at the whole Arthurian tradition, but <clears throat> does it brilliantly if you're familiar with Python's work. The next one is one of my other favorite films. Uh, it does a modern quest for the Holy Grail, something you may have heard of as well from the uh, Indiana Jones series. This is a movie known as the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So um, is this perhaps the last Grail quest? And let's take a look at the scene where they finally you know, passed the test and emerged into the place where the Grail has been kept all along. Certainly is the cup. So still, you have this idea of the cup. Obviously, that was not the cup, but the idea of the cup providing eternal life, right? It's the same theme that you saw in the, uh, the King Arthur tradition, the cup of Christ. Um, perhaps this isn't the last Grail quest. Maybe that was an overstatement. If you're familiar with another really popular work that came out um, <clears throat> not too long ago, The Da Vinci Code. Uh, I'm not going to get into The Da Vinci Code, but it's really a fascinating read if you haven't read it. Uh, the movie is not quite as good as the book, but there is a movie version. And it is a Grail quest of a very, very different sort. Um, so, anyways, the Grail is one, perhaps the most prominent and iconic example of this mythological syncretism that we've been talking about. This idea of blending of ideas, if you're not familiar with the term syncretism. Right, we're bringing together this Celtic idea of a magic cauldron with this Christian idea of the cup of Christ, and it forms what ultimately is the most recognizable symbol of life and rebirth that we actually find in Western mythology. But it's not the only example. Right? What I want to turn to now is other mythological elements that find their way into the, into the tradition of Arthur. So there's more adoption and adaptation that's going on. And we're just going to do a really quick survey of some of those elements. I don't want to spend a lot of time on these because I've spent a lot of time on the Grail. But sticking first with the Christian stuff, right? I mean, the island of Brenton, we already said in the beginning when we did the historical overview last time, that you've got a lot of interaction between different religious ideas and religious cultures. You have Celtic paganism. 
paganism. After that, you've got the Romans invade, and they bring their Roman paganism into the island. You've got Christianization taking place as the entire Roman Empire tends to move towards Christianity. Later, the Anglo-Saxon invasion reintroduces paganism a second time. This time it is Germanic paganism. And then they, too, end up becoming Christianized. So you've got a lot of interaction between different cultures. So you'd imagine you would have a lot of this kind of stuff coming into the Arthurian tradition. The Grail ends up being a Christian image. The other thing that you see in the Grail story, which I mentioned but kind of in passing, was this spear, right? the lance that was bleeding, this mysterious object. Well, it too is drawn from Christian mythology. It's known as the Holy Lance. Sometimes it's known as the Spear of Longinus or the Spear of Destiny. Um, in Mallory's version, this dolorous stroke is issued by Sir Balin to King Pelham by this particular item. Now, the character Longinus, and it's called the Spear of Longinus, Longinus was the centurion, according to the tradition, that speared Jesus on the cross in the side. At the very end of the gospel, you find you know, that Jesus is speared through the side to make sure that he's dead and now flowed blood and water. Um, this is a depiction of the, you know, the centurion spearing Jesus through the side. Supposedly, this is where the lance came from, and the guy's name was Longinus. We have the name actually mentioned in a, an apocryphal gospel known as the Gospel of Nicodemus. And then by the 6th century, we've got a letter called the Letter of Herod to Pilate, which explains that this character of Longinus ends up being condemned into a cave. And every night, there's a lion that emerges in the cave to maul him. And then he's healed. And then it repeats night after night after night after night forever, this constant torture, which should remind you of Prometheus in Greek mythology or Loki in Norse mythology. Okay, So you've got even a blending or a syncretism going on right there with this idea of Longinus. Um, other traditions or later traditions end up making this guy a convert to Christianity and he actually ends up becoming a saint. Now, there doesn't seem to be any longness in the early, I mean, the New Testament documents don't mention a longness. Perhaps the name comes from uh, a description in the Gospel of John. Um, in John 19, there is actually a word, longke, which is used. It means lance. So the word in Greek for lance um, may have been where the word eventually came somehow into Latin and was transformed into a person's name. But anyways, this, this figure is actually becomes a saint within certain traditions of Christianity. And the Spear of Destiny, we find out, has been venerated throughout the centuries. And as early as the 6th century, there were people that claimed to have the Spear of Destiny in their possession. There's a whole movement in the Middle Ages and on of the veneration of holy relics icons and things like that. People collected them. Uh, you find them in various monasteries and churches and now in museums all around the world. And they would often be believed to have some kind of healing power or uh, that you can get some kind of blessing. So when I was in Istanbul years ago, I went into the uh, one museum there. Um, I think it was Topkaki, Topka, uh, <laughs> Topka, Topka, ah, I can't say it. My words are confused. Um, palace, whatever the first word is, um, and they have the supposed arm of John the Baptist in there, and it's really in this gold encased, um, it looks like an arm, but there's a little window open so you could see the bones of whoever it was that was in there. I don't think it was actually John the Baptist, but this is the type of thing that would circulate. So even today, there are at least four separate relics out there that are supposedly parts or the spear itself. Okay, if you know anything about the stories of the First Crusade, in the First Crusade, the soldiers on the Crusade got down to the city of Antioch, which they had ended up taking the city and ended up finding themselves besieged within the city by the Muslim armies outside. And while they were running out of food and quite desperate, there was a vision that somebody had of St. Andrew who told them to dig in the Church of St. Peter, and there they would find the Spear of Destiny, the Holy Spear, which they do. Um, and I actually have a visual reproduction of this. There's actually St. Longinus uh, statue found in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, um, and apparently there is a relic of the spear located in St. Peter's as well. Uh, this is a depiction of the uh, Crusaders digging in the Church of St. Peter in Antioch, and they find... Uh, a spear, at least that's the story. They come out with the spear, it encourages them to push forth and they make a, um, you know, a, a, what is it, a movement outside. They open the gates and they ride out to do battle with the Muslims and end up winning their victory um, thanks to the spear being, you know, brought before them. 
I think a lot of people dismissed that as um, a hoax of some sort. Maybe there was something found, who knows? Maybe it was just something to motivate the troops because there was a religious fervor, obviously, in the crusade movement. But, you know, we find this in various places. There's even a spear in the Hofburg Palace in Austria and in in Vienna that's claimed to be, you know, the spear of destiny. So there's one item that finds its way into the Arthurian tradition. If you want to look at Roman mythology, a character Brutus we mentioned last time, whose name is borrowed into the word Britain, right? He has a grandson, a great-grandson of the Trojan hero Aeneas, who becomes the founder of the Roman people. And then his grandson goes to Britain. The island is named after him, and he becomes really the ancestor of the British kings. Okay, so you've got this whole idea of trans... Um, um, transfer of authority and royal lineage all the way through, all the way back to Troy. Okay, so that finds its way into the story. You have Germanic influences, possibly the sword and the stone, perhaps uh, a Germanic incursion because we've seen before the idea of the sword in the tree, the idea of pulling the sword out of an object, uh, out of an object like a tree, and you know whoever can do something like that is destined to either have the sword or become king, depending on the story you're looking at. Seems to also be. And I think more likely a memory of the early Bronze Age um, bronze casting process. Uh, so this is one way that you can explain the whole idea of the sword and the stone in, I think, a very logical manner. If you know anything about bronze casting, it was a, where you make an alloy between um, two types of metal, copper and tin, and you form bronze. And to do that, of course, you get the fire hot enough and you melt the metals down into the alloy and then you would pour it into molds. So the idea of drawing a sword from a stone might be the memory of drawing a bronze sword out of a, a stone mold where it was cast. Okay, so that may be the origin. But again, it might be also something similar to the Germanic tradition. Other mythological elements from the Celtic world are worth mentioning, and some of these I've already mentioned. For instance, the Isle of Avalon, very, very important site. This is where Arthur is taken at the end of his life, you'll remember. It's also known as the Isle of Apples. Okay, there's this idea in Irish mythology that the Apple Island is actually linked to the other world home of a, of a sea god, Manana MacLear. Um, it's actually called the Isle of Apples in Mallory, not, not Mallory, but um, Jeffrey Monmouth's work in uh, The Life of Merlin. He refers to it not as the Insula Avalonis, but he refers to it as Insula Pomorum, or literally the Isle of Apples. And incidentally, if you remember, on the island in, his, in, in, in Monmouth, you have nine sorceresses, among whom is Morgan, but nine sorcerers that reside there. So this is, again, the underworld journey. Arthur is going to take an underworld journey, just like the heroes we've seen before, but to the Isle of Avalon. In um, uh, Irish, you also have the term uh, Emain Ablach, which seems to be also a variation on this idea of Isle of the Apples. Another Celtic incursion is the uh, character of Morgan Le Fay, or Morgan, who is one of the nine maidens on Avalon. She is based on the Celtic war goddess Morrigan, the Morrigan. Um, this is a prominent figure in Irish mythology. The Welsh mother goddess Madrone, also a possibility. And Madrone, incidentally, is called the daughter of the king of Anwen, the king of the other world. So here you've got Morgan Le Fay as one of the goddesses, or one of the sorceresses, rather, at Avalon. So very clearly a parallel there. And she's a magician. She's a sorceress. So she has some parallels to the Greek character of Medea in a way. Uh, Medea kind of being a villainous character at the end of the story, and Morgan Le Fay really evolving into a um, the bad guy, or kind of an enemy of Arthur in the later stories. Not, not so much in the beginning, but by the end, she's taken on some of those negative aspects. Then we've got Gawain and the story of the Green Knight. Now, Gawain on his own is basically the Celtic sun god type of a character, and the story where he fights Lancelot, which we'll talk about a little bit later, the interesting thing about him is he has the special ability to gain strength as the day progresses between 9 in the morning and noon. He triples in his strength. And Lancelot, of course, picks up on this in the story and is going to be able to capitalize on it. But that's a typical sun god motif, right? The idea of the rising sun up until the point of noon when it's at its pinnacle and its highest point. And then after that, as it declines, as it sets, it becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. And that's the pattern we see with Gawain on the battlefield in some versions. So he seems to be drawn from that. The character of the Green Knight, somebody we have not talked about at all, is a character, a very famous uh, medieval work known as Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, you've got this figure, this mysterious figure, who is all green, wearing this green armor, 
who rides in and challenges the knights to what ultimately is a beheading contest. Uh, Gawain strikes his head off, and then rather than die, the Green Knight ends up picking up his own head and riding off, and he's going to return within a year to exact the um, same penalty on Gawain. This story itself seems to be borrowed from Celtic mythology once again. A very famous Celtic hero, Cúchulainn, um, has a contest with a figure by the name of Kuroi, who challenges a number of heroes to a beheading contest, and the same thing happens. Kuroi's head is lopped off, he picks it up, and then he is going to return with a counter blow, and the only hero brave enough to actually sit there um, is Cúchulainn, without running away in fear. And then, of course, we could add into this mix maybe Merlin, who clearly is drawn from the um, character of Myrthen Wilt, this bardic character, but he's also a druidic figure, so maybe not mythological per se, but definitely something out of Celtic religion, kind of this kind of wise man, prophet, sage figure that is very prominent. Okay, Now, there's one more story that I want to talk about, and this is where we're going to make the transition to talk about the story of Arthur in general, because this one comes from a Greek myth and it plays a huge role in the story as it has developed. So let's take a look at an Arthurian take on a very famous Greek heroic origin story. This is a story you should be familiar with from things we've talked about in the past. So let's talk about the birth of Arthur, the unique birth of Arthur and the castle of Tintagel. We're looking at a love triangle story here. Right, so again, the story, you've got Merlin's going to be intimately involved here, but the love triangle is between Uther Pendragon, the father of Arthur, Duke of Cornwall Gorlaw, and his wife, Egraine. Now, think while we watch this clip. This is a clip from Excalibur we're going to take a look at. Think about where we have seen something very similar to this in Greek mythology. There might be a couple places that come to mind but I think you'll pick it up as you watch. So let's see how it's handled. This one's a little bit lengthy, so just bear with it for a little while. It's worth watching. We have drawn him out. The Duke is off to pursue your men. There he goes. Good. Mount your horse! I will transform you into the semblance of the Duke. Igraine will think her husband has returned. But the cliff, the sea, your lust will hold you up. You will float on the dragon's breath. Okay, a little bit of a lengthy clip, like I said. Um, you probably already have a couple ideas in mind as to where we've seen something similar in Greek mythology. Um, it's interesting here, the character of the Duke dies before they actually have this love affair, which somehow, I th assume, is supposed to uh, make Arthur and the conception a little bit more legitimate because there's going to be, of course, the accusation that Arthur is an illegitimate child. But um, the interesting thing is, of course, Merlin performing the magic. Um, anyways, the Greek mythology, perhaps Paris, Menelaus, and Helen come to mind. Right? This idea of Paris oh, would be a kind of part maybe to Uther stealing uh, Helen away from his, wife, his husband, her husband, <laughs> Menelaus. Um, of course, there's a better one. I don't know if this is the one that came to mind, but the story of Zeus, Amphitryon, and Alcmena with the birth of Heracles. I think this is the most clear parallel that you can uh, point to because you've clearly got the magic, um, shape-changing story. Again, might even remind you a little bit of the story of Sigurd and Gunnar in the um, uh, proposal, basically, to Brunhild in the, um, in the uh, Volsunga saga. But here, again, you don't have a, a magical figure in Uther who is the counterpart to Zeus, but it's Merlin who performs the miracle that changes him into the likeness of uh, the Duke. And this ultimately means Arthur is going to be a new Heracles, right? This is kind of the counterpart. This is the idea. Now, what happens afterward, because Merlin has done this 
deed for Uther's benefit. He wants something in return. So what happens is after the child is born, he's taken by Merlin and he's hidden away from Uther. He's given to a knight by the name of Sir Ector and he's raised by Sir Ector. And the kid is not going to know who his true father is. He's not going to know what his true destiny is. But of course, there is a destiny. This is really in line with everything that we've seen with the family romance, with the, um, the stories that we've looked at from Jason on, right? Oedipus and so on. So it's, again, one of the things that I think makes the Arthur tradition so interesting is it's going to have every single element that we've looked at over the course of the semester when it comes to the hero narrative. Um, let's take a look at another scene. It's going to be a little bit shorter from the same movie where we're going to be looking at the final revelation of identity. Right, so you've got this idea he's raised. He is being trained and mentored by Sir Ector, his brother Kay. He's going to serve as his squire, and he's in training to be a knight, but he's not yet a knight. And then you have this idea of the sword and the stone. This is the item, the magical um, sword that's placed in the, in the churchyard and it's only the person who is destined to be king of England, or rather Britain, that is going to be able to draw the sword from the stone. So in a sense, in essence, there's this idea of his identity and his destiny, his prophecy being all united in this one item. All right, so let's take a look at the story um, with the pulling of the sword as it's presented again in the movie Excalibur. Your sword was stolen, Kay. But here's Excalibur. Oh, has drawn the sword. Kay! Did you free Excalibur from the stone? Yes. No, I didn't. Arthur did. The sword! The sword! Rise, father, please. I was your son before I became your king. If I am king, you are king. The more so because you're not my son. And I'm not your father. Not my father? That Kay is not my brother? Merlin the magician brought you to me when you were newly born and bade me raise you as my own. Okay, so you've got the sword being drawn, right? You've got the character in exile. You've got the mentor, literally a mentor because he's in training to be somebody, right? To be a, a knight. He's a squire at this point. The prophecy tied in with the sword, destiny, mystery, revelation of identity, all the different stages that we've seen before. And then, of course, Excalibur, which is a unique item. Right, this is a magical sword, and it's a little bit confusing. I don't think I've talked about this before, but in the Ethereum tradition, there's actually a couple different swords. There seem to be two swords that go by the name of Excalibur. The sword in the stone originally was not named. Um, it's a miraculous stone attached to his destiny, but it was originally wasn't called Excalibur. Excalibur was a sword that was given to him later in the story by an unnamed lady of the lake. Okay, along with a magical scabbard. And that part of the story is kind of interesting because it's a little bit like the motif we see in hero mythology where you've got the invulnerable hero. So in the story of the scabbard, he's asking you know, which is more valuable, the sword or the scabbard that holds the sword. And he finds the sword, of course, more valuable. Who wouldn't, right? What, what, what's the big deal about a scabbard? And he comes to find out that the scabbard itself is magical and has the ability to stop him from bleeding to death if he ever becomes wounded. So literally, he's woundable, right? He's not invulnerable, but he won't die from the wound so long as he's wearing the scabbard. And in the course of the story, as it develops, it's eventually stolen from him. In Mallory's version, his sister Morgana steals the scabbard from him and replaces it with a fake. And ultimately, this thing ends up disappearing from the story as it's thrown into the water at one point and never comes back. So um, kind of got this invulnerable character with a little bit of a vulnerability there. Now, what you notice in the scene is, of course, not only the revelation, but the idea that you have a division, right? You're supposed to have this unification that comes about with King Arthur, right? Here's the guy who's destined to unite the realm to be the king of all Britain, and immediately the reaction by the knights is division, right? He's a child. He's not a knight. He's not experienced. Um, he's not worthy. He's a bastard. All these different things are thrown at him, and you have a series of battles that take place as 
Arthur begins to unite the kingdom. And this takes a little bit of time in the Mallory account, but in the movie they go through it fairly quickly. The one guy that says he's going to support him in this scene is a guy by the name of Leo de Grance. Now, Leo de Grance is important because he is going to be the future father-in-law for King Arthur. So I want to take a look at one more scene, kind of where this combat wraps up. In the movie they do this very quickly, but they... Um, in the story, he goes. He does go to the aid of Leo de Grance at his stronghold, and this is where he's going to ultimately meet Guinevere. So in the movie, I'm not going to show you the scene where he meets Guinevere, but you can see her in this clip. But this is the scene where um, the battle kind of culminates, kind of a one-on-one -on -one in the movie between Arthur and Sir Uriens. Um, so let's just take a look at this, and you can see how it works out, and then we'll talk a little bit more about it. You're right. I'm not yet a knight. You, Irians, will knight me. That a knight tonight, I can't offer you mercy. What's this? What's this? St. Michael and St. George, I give you the right to bear arms and the power to meet justice. That duty I will solemnly obey as knight and king. I never saw. Excalibur is a very overly dramatic rendition of the of the story of Arthur and uh, it uses a lot of symbolism. You can see clearly here perhaps the um, you know baptism idea. Here they're standing in the water like in the Jordan River where the John, John the Baptist baptizes Jesus and there's this kind of role reversal. Um, probably intentionally done by the director of the film but you know the dialogue's a little bit wooden. The acting is a little um, different. Um, like I said overly dramatic but you do find a number of really really accomplished actors in this movie. Of course at the time when this movie was made, they most of them hadn't really um, reached the pinnacle of their career. And the scene, Leo de Grance, if you haven't noticed, is uh, played by Patrick Stewart, who later goes on to you know Star Trek fame and uh, X Men fame and stuff like that. But um, Leo de Grance is going to be, like I said, the the, the father of who is the father of Guinevere, and they're going to be the father-in-law of Arthur. And it's through him that the knight, uh, the knights get the Round Table. Uh, it's actually a gift to Arthur from Leo de Grance as part of the wedding, the dowry that goes with Guinevere to the king. And the importance of the Round Table is that it is round, which symbolizes something very important. It's this idea of equality, right? The union of the kingdom and the idea of everything, um, everybody around it being equal. I think I hinted at that before when we looked at the Grail story, but um, this is where it comes from in, in the actual tradition. <clears throat> Later in the story, of course, war, more war breaks out. He eventually unifies the kingdom, but Arthur is going to go on and go to war in Europe. Okay, so Arthur's wars uh, continue and uh, eventually culminate with the conquest of Rome. So that's uh, something that I'm not going to cover as we discuss the story, but it is an important element in the tradition that he becomes not just king but emperor. And he uh, has some really important battles in Europe, particularly the famous battle with the great giant at uh, Mount Saint-Michel, which is kind of another David and Goliath um, parallel. So again, all these Christian elements come into the story at various places, which is kind of interesting. What I want to focus on is really the relationship between Arthur and Mordred and Arthur and Guinevere and then the character of Lancelot. So let's take a look at the things that now are going to plague this supposedly ideal kingdom. You've got this ideal Camelot, the round table, union and equality, and all the great things that go with Arthur. Knights shining armor and chivalry and you know, a code of conduct, etc. But in the midst of all of that, you've got a very bad problem that emerges, and it's going to begin with a relationship that Arthur has with a woman who he does not realize is his sister, and this is the woman known as Margaus. He's got a number of half-sisters in the story. These are children by the Duke of Cornwall and Igraine prior to Uther coming on the, on the scene. And, of course, he doesn't know about these sisters because he was raised, again, not knowing who he was, never met his parents. Anyways, Margaus is the wife of a king by the name of Lot, and she has a number of children, among them Gawain, Agravain, Gareth, and Gaharis. Half-sister of Arthur, but he ends up sleeping with her unknowingly. And the result of their incestuous relationship is the child Mordred. Now, Mordred is going to be the big bad guy. 
Okay, now Mordred II is going to be raised away from his parent, right? Away from his father, really not knowing uh, a lot about that. Or at least Arthur is going to be completely ignorant as to the true identity of Mordred for the most of the story. Um, after this event, Merlin comes along and tells Arthur that because of his incest, he has angered God, right? God is angry with you. And as a result of this child, there's this prophecy again attached, which is the destruction of the kingdom, right? This union is going to result in a child who will end up destroying you and destroying your kingdom. This is like the prophecy around the kid Paris for Troy. Now, Merlin gives him some really bad advice at this point, which Arthur listens to. And the advice is to gather all the babies that were born on a particular day in the realm, put them on a boat, send them out to sea where they can be left to die. Okay, this is a, a, a slaughter of the innocents moment like King Herod in the Bible or uh, Pharaoh in Egypt in the book of Exodus. Again, uh, he does this. Arthur listens. He gathers the children together. But like all of these stories, the child is going to survive. All of the other babies are killed, but the one child that he needs to eliminate is not eliminated. He's found. He's raised. He's kind of raised in secret. Eventually, he's going to be introduced to the court as Arthur's nephew, Okay, which he is. Of course, he's also his son. Kind of complicated when you get into these incestuous relationships. But the result of this is that Merlin comes back and says, God is not your friend, which is a really bad proclamation. Now, think of it in the context of we've been looking at along um, the semester. We've seen gods that have been enemies to heroes. The most famous, of course, Heracles and his animosity with or or antagonism um, with the goddess Hera. Hera is an opponent of Heracles, and she's out to destroy him, really plagues him through his entire life from the time he was an infant to his um, labors later on. Partly due to his own anger, but still, nonetheless, she is a goddess who plagues him and causes him to suffer and uh, be humiliated. Now, it's one thing for Hera to be out to get you, right? She's just one of a number of limited beings in the Greek pantheon. But when it comes to the monotheistic worldview of the King Arthur tradition, it's one god who is omnipotent, all-present, all-powerful, um, it's an, an all-knowing. So the idea of God being out to get you is a very different type of thing. It's the idea that you, you cannot avoid uh, a consequence of this type of thing. And what we're going to see is the eventual consequence for the entire kingdom because of Arthur's foolishness, okay? His inability to make the wise decision. Even though he's supposed to be the great king, his character is going to lack something. Okay, and we're going to see this work out even more when we get to the romance between Lancelot and his wife, Guinevere. Now, Merlin warns him one more time that he needs to not marry the woman he's kind of set on, Guinevere. And he tells him that she is not going to be faithful to you. She's going to love another more than she loves you. And he also warns him of Lancelot being the man. So with this warning in mind, what does Arthur do? He ignores the warning. Okay, in one instance, he listens to Merlin's advice and does a horrible thing by murdering all these children. In another instance, he doesn't listen to Merlin's advice, and this time he makes the mistake again. Now, he's going to marry her. Now, Merlin, after this, kind of departs from the story. You don't see very much of Merlin. As a matter of fact, what happens to Merlin in Mallory's version is he is um, the tutor of a young sorceress by the name of Nimue. In earlier versions, this is the character of Vivian. She is going to become the Lady of the Lake at a certain point. But uh, Nimue, who Merlin falls in love with, does not find Merlin to be, you know, she doesn't return the favor. Uh, And being plagued by Merlin, she ends up deciding to eliminate him by imprisoning him in an enchanted cave where he is going to be for the rest of the um, whoever knows how long. Um, he never shows back up in the story. And she goes on to become the next magical um, advisor to King Arthur, kind of the meeting of the goddess motif in um, the hero's journey. And she's going to become a protector for Arthur. So... Anyways, the romance picks up after the wedding of Arthur. You have the character of Lancelot introduced, and Lancelot is the best knight in the realm. Okay, without a doubt. Um, There's, by the way, a picture of Nimue and um, um, Merlin, kind of enchanted by her. Lancelot. Okay, let's go back to him. He's a romantic hero, probably the true, the first true romantic hero in mythology, perhaps. Uh, He is the best of the knights, and he is going to be an example of what we call courtly love. 
So if we don't know what courtly love is, this is a special kind of devotion that we find in this type of literature. We don't know if this is actually something that went on very much in the, in the era, but it's definitely in the literature of the era, where a knight has a special devotion, almost a self-sacrificial service rendered to a woman who he loves that is somehow beyond his grasp. This is often a married woman. Okay, if you know anything about the idea of arranged marriages, I know we've talked about that in the context of Greek mythology, but again here you get this idea that the marriages, especially among the upper class nobility, was often a marriage of political union, often with the exchange of lands and various types of relationships. So it wasn't always for love. The idea of a courtly romance is the idea that you now have the opportunity to have a freely chosen, um, non-contractual relationship with somebody, kind of an extramarital affair. Uh, it's this idea of a forbidden passion and this idea of this desirable torture that one goes through as they continue, continually do things to um, attain this woman who is always beyond their grasp, or at least most of the time beyond their grasp. It's the idea of an idealization of the female or the feminine, a veneration, homage, it's a new type of heroic motivation. We said before that there are lots of things that motivate heroes over the course of mythology, but the uh, history of mythology and the history of heroic stories, but very rarely do you see a truly romantic motivation. Right? You've got guys that fight for their wives, like Rama. You've got guys that do things for the love of a woman, like Paris, but they're not usually promoted as a romantic type of a thing or where they are romantic in the modern sense, like Paris and Helen. It's not a, a, a virtuous thing. It's a, it's a bad thing. Okay, so here's Lancelot, who we said before when we talked about the Knight of the Cart. He's willing to be humiliated. He's willing to do whatever it takes for the sake of Guinevere. He loves her, and he rejects all other women in his pursuit for her. But it's interesting because to cover up the fact that he loves her, he does all these wonderful deeds of um, valiant chivalry towards women. Okay, out there that he doesn't have any interest in, and it's partly to conceal the fact that he loves Guinevere. If he just does things for her, it's going to be too obvious that he's in love with the queen. So he does things for women in general to, to cover it up. It's part of the part of the ruse. Okay. Now, it's a love affair in their hearts. This is not a love affair that's been consummated physically, as far as we know, in the Mallory version, like it was in the earlier version. Chrétien de Troyes, when he first introduces Lancelot, they do sleep together. But in this version, there's a question about what has happened. Now, like I said, as an affair of the heart, it becomes common knowledge that Lancelot and Guinevere are in love. Not just common knowledge, um, knowledge that even Arthur himself possesses. He knows about it. He knows how they feel about it. But the key thing is he is not going to do anything about it. He remains silent. He kind of closes his eyes, pretends it's not going on, and goes about his business. He doesn't want to break up the round table. He doesn't want to break up the relationship that he has. I mean, he loves Guinevere. He loves Lancelot. And Lancelot has done a lot for the realm. Okay, so he probably doesn't want to jeopardize that as well. But... Somebody is interested in revealing this, bringing it all out in the open, and this is going to be our villain, Mordred. Now, along with Agravain, his half-brother, he decides he's going to reveal the relationship publicly. He's going to try to catch Lancelot alone with the queen in the queen's chambers. And he gets the king to kind of go along with this, to, to go away and allow them to, to do this, which the king does. He and a number of other knights, including Agravain, burst in, essentially, on Guinevere and Lancelot while they're alone in the bedroom. Nothing apparently has happened, but in the skirmish that follows, Lancelot ends up killing almost all the knights, including Agravain, with the exception of Mordrin, who flees and survives. Lancelot himself ends up fleeing from Camelot and retreating now that everything's been brought out into the open. But because it's in the open, Arthur now has to involuntarily act. He has to do something that he has hesitated to do, and that is to accuse the queen, to condemn her for her actions, okay? He has to deal with the offense. And this is a tendency that I think we all tend to have when we're confronted with problems. It's often easier to close our eyes and pretend it's not there. And the lesson in the story, of course, is that the thing doesn't generally go away. Uh, it usually gets worse. And until you deal with it, you're um, going to you know, continue to suffer in silence, and then at some point it might be a little bit too late, which is what the case is with Arthur. He has to condemn her to being burned, and the one person that's defending Lancelot and Guinevere this whole time is the character of Gawain, who is Arthur's right-hand man, more or less. 
And he says, these guys have been loyal to you. Don't jump to the conclusion that anything inappropriate has happened. You know, don't condemn her to burn. You need to give this time. He actually blames his own brother. Remember, Gawain is a brother of Agravain, half-brother of Mordred. Um, he actually advised Agravain not to do what he was about to do. And the fact that Gal- um, sorry, Lancelot kills Agravain, he, he doesn't blame Lancelot for doing that. He actually says, you know, it's Agravain's own fault. So he, again, is going to be in the corner, at this point at least, of Guinevere and Lancelot. And when the king orders Gawain to escort her to the trial, essentially, Gawain protests. He says, I'm not going to do this. I think it's wrong for you to condemn her to death. And he allows his brothers, Gareth and Gaharis, to do this in his place. And what they do, also being in protest against this um, condemnation, they say, we'll do it, but we're going to do it without our armor. We're not going to go armed. You know, we're going to escort her in our normal clothes. Now, this is where things go horribly wrong, because in the last moment, in rides Lancelot to the rescue. In his armor, and he cuts through anybody that is in his way of rescuing the queen. And in doing so, he ends up killing Gawain's brothers, Gareth and Gaharis. And at this point, Gawain goes from being kind of the defender of Lancelot to becoming the avenger. He is now going to hold Lancelot responsible for the death of his two innocent brothers. And he is going to want vengeance. Okay, And this is what's going to split the kingdom into an official civil war. It's going to be Arthur and Gawain versus Lancelot. And I notice Arthur here I put into the parentheses because it's really Gawain at this point that is driving the policy of the kingdom. Right? Arthur is kind of along for the ride. He's not the leader. He's the follower. And that's another sign that things are drastically wrong at this point. They go and besiege um, Joyous Guard, which is the, the castle of Lancelot, in an attempt to get uh, Guinevere back and punish him. And eventually Lancelot does return the queen to the king and attempts to make peace. And Arthur is really happy to make peace, but it's again Gawain that refuses to let it pass. Okay, They end up pursuing Lancelot to the mainland, to France, and eventually you have the showdown between Gawain and Lancelot where Gawain is wounded in battle. Now, this is the scene where he grows in strength from nine to noon. Day after day they fight. Um, he's wounded once Lancelot realizes what's going on, and in the afternoon as Gawain begins to weaken, he um, gives him a, a, a very serious wound to the head. He goes and recovers after a number of weeks. They fight again. He gets re-wounded, and this goes on to the point where Gawain ultimately has a wound that he's not going to heal from. He's mortally wounded, um, and Gawain is going to pass from the story. So um, you're left with, again, a divided kingdom. But in the midst of all this, in the midst of all this fighting that's going on, and Arthur really being away from Camelot, the real problem manifests because he leaves Camelot essentially in the hands of his nephew Mordred which is the exact wrong person, okay? Now, Mordred is interested in possessing Guinevere. He attempts to wed Guinevere. She, in this story, flees from him. Remember, in Geoffrey of Monmouth's version, she actually ends up with Mordred and betrays uh, King Arthur. In this version, she flees from Mordred and hides herself up in the Tower of London. Eventually, you have the showdown between father and son, right? This is like Luke and Darth Vader again. Rather, they're like Arthur and Mordred again. But it's the Battle of Kamlan. This is one of the earliest uh, battles that we have record of. And it's a famous battle where they mutually um, kill each other, right? It's a mutual destruction scene. So I'm going to just show you a very brief clip of this, again, from the movie Excalibur with Mordred and Arthur on the battlefield at Kamlan. <clears throat> Here we go. No. Come, Father, let us embrace at last.
it's like Thor and the world serpent, right? Thor kills the world serpent, but he's wounded so severely in the process that he dies right afterward. Or like Beowulf and the dragon. Okay, it was a victory for the hero, but at the same time, he gives his life in attaining the victory. Uh, the movie, of course, again, overly dramatic. The spear through the plate armor is a little hard to buy, a little too easy. I don't think spears could press through plate armor so easily. But um, again, his death scene follows. And what happens, not just in the story, but in the movie, is you have the uh, return of Excalibur to the lake. Uh, thrown back to the Lady of the Lake. Now, in the in the in the story, the sword is given to Sir Bedivere, and Sir Bedivere attempts to throw it in obedience to Arthur. But what he ends up doing is hides it, decides to come back and tell Arthur that he's thrown the sword away. Arthur asks him what he saw, and Bedivere says, uh, "I saw it go into the water. Really, nothing unusual. Exactly what you would expect to see when a sword goes into the water." And Arthur says, "Well, you didn't throw it back." You know, you're lying to me, basically. Go and do it for real this time. And a second time, he does the same thing. He hides the sword, comes back, and tells him that he threw it away. And then the third time, he finally throws the sword back. The number three, of course, always very important in um, <clears throat> mythology, particularly in Christian uh, circles. But in the movie, they do the same thing, but with uh, Sir Percival taking the role of Sir Bedivere, again, to kind of keep the cast smaller than um, you want. But uh, I'll just watch the the scene where um, Arthur is telling Percival to take the sword and throw it back to the lake. When you cast it in, what did you see? I saw nothing but the wind on the water. My king, I couldn't do it. Excalibur cannot be lost. Other men... Do as I command. One day, the king will come, and the sword will rise again. Dramatic music, the sword descends, right? This is, again, that the waters at the time of his death, this is the beginning of the end for Arthur. And the idea with the sword being thrown back, returned to the water, is, again, the prophecy that there's going to be a future for the sword, right? It's being uh, returned until the time when it's needed. You have this idea of the once and future king. And at that point, when Arthur dies, he's taken off to the land of Avalon, or the Isle of Avalon. This is his descent into the, into the other world, into the underworld, right? He dies. He's taken in a boat across the waters of death by the four maidens, among them the Lady of the Lake Nimue, the, um, his sister Morgana. And on his tomb is inscribed exactly what I said. Here lies Arthur, once and future king. So it's left open. You know, what has become of Arthur and what will become of Arthur uh, down the road? Um, it's kind of the conquest of death idea, right? He doesn't actually have um, a return from the underworld like some of the heroes like Hades, or Heracles coming back from Hades, or uh, Aeneas going down to Hades and returning. Arthur goes off to his Hades at the end, and the idea is one day he's going to return. Okay, so it's put off into the future, um, which, again, lends itself to all kinds of wonderful stories told about Arthur going forward, because this wasn't it, right? Mallory wasn't the last version. It might be the definitive version, but there were lots of stories told about Arthur afterward, thousands of them, okay? Even in the modern world, we've got tons of stories produced, not just in literature, but in um, movie format or television series format. So um, with the kind of summary of the story there, I want to move. And again, what I want you to realize when you look at this idea of this future king, right, this prophecy that Arthur is going to return, you've got to ask yourself after what you've just seen unfold, is is that a good thing? I mean, here's a king who's supposed to be this ideal monarch, this golden age, this ideal Camelot, but what you saw is a king who makes horrible decisions. I mean, he doesn't listen to Merlin when he should. He listens to Merlin when he shouldn't. 
Um, he c- kills all kinds of children along the way. He's um, got God out to get him, and ultimately he is undone by his own sin and incest. And all of these things bring the kingdom apart. And even when it comes to his relationship with his wife, you know, he ignores the problem until it's too late and then allows a guy like Gawain and his passion for vengeance to carry the kingdom into civil war. I mean, is this the ideal king? Um, you know, the earlier sources, he's supposed to be this great monarch, but as it evolves in the story, he ends up being somewhat less than ideal. Um, and again, there's quite a bit of, you know, moral lesson that can be communicated through these stories, but um, you would want to know, you know, would we want an Arthur to return? Perhaps not. But anyways, we do have this story kind of continuing on into the modern age. So let's take a look at some of the ways Hollywood's handled it just very briefly to kind of summarize. You've got versions of the story that have been crafted for children. If you're familiar with Disney version, 1963, the film Sword in the Stone, it's an animated um, story that really focuses on exactly that, the child Arthur and the drawing of the sword from the stone. As a matter of fact, the entire movie is just a buildup to the drawing of the sword, which I will show you in this very famous scene from that film. There in the churchyard, a sword. Oh, Archimedes, a sword. You were going to have a time pulling it out. Watch it, boy. That was the Disney attempt. I mean, this is obviously prior to the the modern computer animation, old style, um, done for children. It's basically inspired. There was a kind of a revival of Arthurian stuff in the mid 20th century, uh, particularly due to the writings of T. H. White and his Sword in the Stone and his Once and Future King. And this one's kind of drawing on that for children. You also have around the same time a musical version of Camelot produced originally for the theater. This was a you know uh, kind of a Broadway musical, 1960. But there was a film version made, 1967. It's known as Camelot, kind of a lengthy musical rendition. I'm just going to show you a very brief clip of a scene where Arthur is um, singing to Guinevere early in their relationship. The crown has made it clear. The climate must be perfect all the year. A law was made a distant moon ago here. July and August cannot be too hot. And there's a legal limit to the snow here in Camelot. So, I mean, you're singing about you know, the, the, the wonders of Camelot here. Of course, it's a uh, you know, musical version, and what you see uh, on the screen, of course, is um, Richard Harris playing King Arthur, and he's a figure that you might be more familiar with because of his role as uh, the original Dumbledore in the uh, Harry Potter movies um, before he passed away, unfortunately, and was replaced by another actor. So the first couple um, Harry Potter movies feature... Richard Harris. Uh, Another movie that actually pokes fun at this one, someone we just talked about a second ago, um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Um, They actually, um, this was made in 1975, and they actually, I think intentionally, not only make fun of the Arthurian tradition, but they make fun of the musical Camelot version that was done on stage. And this particular scene um, is clearly uh, uh, an ode kind of to that uh, musical. Well, on second thoughts, let's not go to Camelot. It is a silly place. Right. The actual scene in the movie is a little bit longer than that. I just wanted to give you the tail end of it because, uh, you know, again, if you are familiar with Camelot, you would know what they're doing in Monty Python. But there are lots of other movies that follow. Excalibur, the one that we've been looking at. This is 1981. Like I said, overly dramatic, um, kind of an epic feature, uh, really expensive production. I would really like to see them remake this, maybe with better acting. Um, and a bigger budget with modern um, you know, special effects and things like that. But uh, 
it's interesting as 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 amazing as the movie is all of the main actors really didn't do very much after that it's really the peripheral cast that ends up going on to have a great career i mentioned patrick stewart playing leo de grand so you have uh, liam neeson before he was well known he was the one that plays gawain um, and you've got other characters helen mirren plays morgan Le Fay. she actually becomes a really really big star you probably heard of helen mirren but um, that, I think, is the definitive version as far as Hollywood's concerned, the one that sticks the closest to the original story. But other versions were attempted after that. You've got First Night, which was, uh, came out, what was it, 1995, uh, starring Sean Connery as King Arthur. So how could you go wrong there? Well, I think they did a lot wrong with that particular movie. Um, not one of the better King Arthur movies, even though you have one of the greatest actors of his day. Uh, it's really focusing on the romance between Lancelot and Guinevere. Uh, Lancelot being played here by, uh, what's his name, Richard Gere. Um, I don't think he fit the role too too well, but um, that's a, a version 1995. You have the attempt at doing a historical version in 2004. Uh, King Arthur, simple title, easy to remember, um, presents kind of the... Roman version of King Arthur, based on the character of Lucius Artorius Castus, set again now, not in the second century where the name actually shows up historically, but in the late fifth century at the end of the Roman Empire. Um, kind of butchers the story of King Arthur, um, attempts to do a historical story, and at the same time messes up the history and messes up the story. Not one of my favorite versions, but an interesting movie. One of the ones I enjoyed the most, a movie called The Last Legion that came out in 2007. It was based on a book by the same title. This one actually is an attempt to kind of put Arthur into a historical context as well, but focuses not on Arthur so much as the character of Aurelius, right? Aurelius Ambrosius, who is the Roman uh, general who ends up uh, sheltering the last Roman emperor, this boy, Romulus Augustus, um, and brings him to Britain. And you've got this whole engagement with the character of Vortigern and um, the, um, the, the, the Saxons and things like that. It's, it's a really interesting film. It's more of a, a fun story, uh, not to be taken too seriously, but it's a, it's a good film as at least an entertainment. But I like the fact that they tie it in again to some of those early traditions that eventually evolve into the King Arthur story. And then the last one that I know of that came out back in 2017 was King Arthur Legend of the Sword, which I thought was going to be a really, really well done King Arthur movie because it was made by Guy Ritchie and had a, a pretty big budget. But if you've seen the movie... Um, it really does nothing uh, to preserve the story of King Arthur whatsoever. Um, basically makes the main villain, again, Vortigern, who ends up being the brother of Uther Pendragon and King Arthur. Um, again, a very weird take on the story. I think it was more of a Hollywood attempt to just utilize special effects and CGI to create some kind of blockbuster action-adventure movie. It's entertaining, but again, I think it has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with King Arthur, the way the story was meant to be. So anyways, with that being said, we've really taken a look at the entire Arthurian world as much as we can in the amount of time that we had. Hopefully you got something out of it. Um, from here, we're going to be moving on to really modern stuff. The next time we're going to discuss is going to be with uh, the story of um, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. We're going to take a look at the C.S. Lewis tradition, and we're going to eventually work our way to Harry Potter, which I brought up a number of times here. Remember, Merlin is actually a figure that is uh, actually in some ways tied to the Harry Potter world. He's referred to a number of times in the um, Harry Potter materials. As you would imagine, again, being a story about magic, witchcraft, and wizardry, Merlin is the great wizard, the greatest of the wizards. So for now, I think we've covered um, King Arthur as much as is possible. So hopefully, like I said, you understand a little bit more about the story and get something out of the discussion.